Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to If Data Could Talk. I'm Andy Cotgrieve. And today, the data geeks are uniting with the board game geeks. Yes, we're going to look at what board games can teach us about data visualization. Uh, I'm a huge board game fan, so this is a very exciting episode. Uh, also, if you've ever been looking for gift ideas for the data geek in your life, perhaps the next uh, 20, 30, 40 minutes of your life will give you some good ideas. And we have an extremely special guest, hugely qualified to talk about this topic. Please welcome Jeff Engelstein. Uh, Jeff is an award-winning tabletop game designer. His titles include Space Cadets, Pit Crew, The Expanse, and Super Skill Pinball. Uh, he's also a noted podcaster, contributor to the Dice Tower on the math, science, and psychology of games. He's authored uh, a few great books, and he teaches board game design at the New York University Game Center. Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. How did you get into board games? Well, first off, thanks for having me on the show. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, you know, board games have always been a part of my life. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's just something that seems to have taken over more and more of a life as I've gotten uh, older. But, you know, from from a game design standpoint, uh, you know, I, I find it that it kind of naturally reflects uh, my interest in science and engineering, which is kind of what I'm trained in. But, you know, designing board games and is, is a fun, creative outlet that still, you know, has restrictions, uh, which we're going to kind of talk about in terms of being able to, uh, you know, make things understandable to the players and to kind of make them feel like they're doing the activity that, that you're talking about. So, uh, you know, just for me, it's always been about relating a lot of these, these different types of, of activities to board games. And so that's why I'm, I'm really interested to, to talk with you today and excited about it. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much. Really excited to share this conversation with you. But uh, you're also a tablet user, right? Because you have a engineering job. Is that right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, I run an engineering firm. So yeah, part of, you know, when we track our, our hours and do our dashboards and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've been a tablet user for, for many, many, many years. So I, I, I love the product and I think it's pretty cool and, and fun to work with. So yes. Amazing. Brilliant. Uh, great. Well, let's crack on. And obviously, while, while we're watching, you can all play the game and try and identify how many, see how many games behind Jeff uh, you can identify. Um, <laughs> Jeff, how big is your game collection? Uh, I have an excessive collection of about 2000 titles or so right now. So yeah, it's, it's really, it's a hobby that's gotten out of control. Yes. Uh, I think I'm about a hundred games. So, uh, <laughs> some way to go. Um, so let's go. We're going to talk about four or five principles of data visualization and recommend games that use those same principles. Uh, Jeff, you're going to start. Uh, because we're going to talk about the simple iconography of these things, dice. Um, What's, is there any purer way to encode numeric information, Jeff? <laughs> I love dice. Dice, dice are uh, it's so versatile. And, you know, just seeing the, the development of games over the last uh, 10 or 20 years and the different ways that dice are used has just been great. But uh, that's, that's, that's a whole other topic. But yeah, uh, you know, we can talk about, um, you mentioned one of my games, Super Skill Pinball, uh, which is a, a way of playing pinball as a board game, it's it's a, a type of game of what's called a roll and write, where you just roll the dice and then you mark off on your pinball board there with a marker. You know, it's it's uh, the nice thing is that the dice, the iconography of dice, those dice dot patterns that you see are just uh, so ingrained in us um, that it makes it very easy for people to look at it and when they roll the dice to be able to pick out uh, the patterns that match to the dice. Um, and one of the things that we take for granted a little bit, I think, is that how distinctive those patterns are. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's important in general for icons is that you need to be able to identify them at the distance. Uh, most mm -hmm. of us don't actually like count the dots, right? We'll see if we see the open box pattern, oh, it's a four. If you see kind of the two stripes, it's a six, right? If you see the X pattern, it's a five. And we just sort of know that and can see those from a distance. And this was kind of uh, hit home to me recently uh, when uh, we we have an expansion uh, coming out uh, for the game um, with some new tables. Uh, and uh, in this one, as a special little extra thing is, it's called Top Speed, and uh, you it actually is, is about racing cars, and you can accelerate your car, hit the gas, and hit the brake. And when you hit the gas, you actually add to your dice. So you can add a plus one, a plus two, or a plus three. So we needed icons for seven, eight, and nine. Um, and the graphic team came up with uh, the 789, and you can see that the 789 in the bumper 
Uh, actually, the one over to, yeah, that one there shows yeah. all three. And this was the pattern that they chose. And when I was testing this board, I found that the dis the difference between the seven and the eight as, as they had laid it out was just not ingrained in my mind. You know, you just didn't have the same reaction to it. And I, it always, I hesitated. I just had that momentary stumble where, uh, is that a seven or is that an eight? And you don't want to start counting the dots. You have to be able to recognize the pattern. Yeah. Um, so, so ultimately we did end up changing those patterns. We changed the eight so that it was a box with a, with a hole in the middle and the seven, we also, I don't have examples of this, but the seven was changed to more like an H pattern. Um, ah. And so we just, we straightened out those lines on the side. So this is an older version that, that I brought to, to show everybody here. And uh -huh. I think it's important when you're, you're choosing icons or choosing layouts to A, take advantage of, of any preconceived notions people have for what icons should be and, and feed into that. But also if you have to make new ones to make sure that they're very distinctive and easy to interpret at a glance, right? You shouldn't have to lean in to be able to differentiate two different icons if you're doing like uh, icon stack bars or something like that and you have icons under them. You need yeah. to be able to just glance at it and see what's going on. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's so true. And I, I've got an image here of um, yeah. standard dice and then there's a huge industry um, of custom dice, right? You know, they look gorgeous, they're designed, they're beautifully designed, but we, you know, you know this, Jeff, and I, we've all had moments where we're sitting across a table and you've got to have a D6 to beat your opponent and you roll a dice. When you hit that, everybody <laughs> across the table is up in arms or, yep. or in grief because it's so identifiable and dice like this, they're gorgeous, but you have to go, did you, did you roll that six, Jeff? Oh, you did. Uh, oh, <laughs> that moment's slightly lost. So Yeah, uh, and even dice that have just numbers on the face, just plain numbers. Mm. Right, which I, which had come in a lot of games, even on a six sided dice, it takes you an extra second to parse what that number is. Whereas yeah. the, the dots, you don't. The dots, you can just instantly interpret. Yeah, so uh, fantastic. So icons, that's great. Um, I'd like to talk more about icons because you know, as you've said, that iconography it's about a language, about condensing information in a rapid, rapidly understandable way that most people will understand. Now, that's what we have to do as data communicators a huge amount. We see them on Tableau public visits and corporate dashboards all the time. So how about a game devoted entirely to icons? Uh, and for that, we've got a game called Concept. Uh, this is charades, but played with icons. Uh, you're going to get a concept that you have to get your team to guess by placing um, uh, pieces and linking icons together to describe that, context, that concept. Uh, have you played this one, Jeff? I have. Uh, I am terrible at it, uh, but it's a, yeah, it's a fun sort of a party game, but it's also kind of a thinky party game. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a clue of something that you have to try to get your teammates to guess. I mean, just like in, in charades, as you said, uh, but you, you, you can't communicate at all other than by putting pawns and cubes and exclamation points and question marks and things yeah. on these different symbols. And so you have to Indeed. try to think of, you know, how can I convey this concept and it forces you to kind of break things down into, you know, their, their core, you know, core ideas. Right. And, yeah. and it can foster also a lot of interesting conversations with people because you're yeah. just totally not on the same wavelength as they are. <laughs> Absolutely. So if I'm going to, we're going to play a game, Jeff, I'm going to give oh, you a concept. Excellent. Yes. You can see how uh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the question mark indicates the thing we're trying to, the concept we're trying to get across. So there's your concept. And then here's a, Subconcept, which describes something else a bit more contextual about this object. Uh, what are we describing, Jeff? Um, well, what you it looks like a, a flag, I guess, with uh, uh, red, white, and blue, or blue, white, and red. I don't know if the order is important. So I, I would, it's something. Uh, so, so the so main something so we you did, find the, in a city is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, no. So we're we're trying to find um, uh, a thing made of this and this is a oh, thing made of steel yeah and then this is okay. a contextual clue perhaps about the geographical location of said thing ah okay how, so how, how good are your flags? france so yep. oh perhaps the eiffel tower you got it jeff right <laughs> oh there, <laughs> there you go. go okay it was the eiffel tower uh, i appreciate you making me look smart on your podcast thank you <laughs> 
Well, uh, it, of course, the great thing about the game is if you can't get it, is that your fault or is that my fault? Ah, and then we can have that argument. And <laughs> I'm now, glad I didn't have to guess yeah. Marilyn Manson. That's all. <laughs> well, well, that's my next point, right? Because <laughs> what I, I gave you an easy one, right? Yeah. And as you can see on every card, the concepts get really, <laughs> really quite complicated. So if we were take, to take um, my precious, you know, you'd be like, well, how would you do that? And then suddenly it all gets a little bit more complicated. So you might think, okay, the main concept is a phrase. And perhaps the subconcept is it's a phrase from a movie about yeah. a metal thing that is ring shaped and yellow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of course, you might choose a different phrase from Lord of the Rings. Who knows? Because, but uh, yeah, this is so it's about um, that iconography. And you, you're right, you totally touched on it there, Jeff. That, Playing this game, I find, is like a exercise in a failed usability test. You, know, <laughs> you put your icons on your dashboards or on the boarding concepts, and you think, well, everyone's going to know what this means. And then, yeah, as, as we've seen, it doesn't make as much sense as you think. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's one of the, like you said, the interesting thing is that you can start to see how other people perceive stuff, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that they maybe, and you realize how your, um, uh, you know, your biases come through and and you think something another good game for this if you uh if, if you're into this kind of uh sort of psychological analysis is a game called wavelength uh mm. where you set up a scale you know and the scale can be you know something from not a sandwich to a sandwich uh or something like you know and, yeah. then, and then you have some clue and you have to you know basically turn this dial that goes from zero to a hundred and and you have you know all these arguments with people on where where something fits in that area and what what the person felt and it just brings up you know and i think scales you know kind of come into that idea of data visualization also of you know kind of setting your boundaries and things like that yeah of, you know, what where people feel that stuff what what the minimum and maximum really represent yeah and so i i, I wavelength has been a great um lockdown game because it's very easy to play remotely mm -hmm. um but an example that if you if you if your concept was burrito it's like well how much of a sandwich is a burrito, you know? And right. then I, 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 I don't even go there because I feel like I might offend people uh, saying it isn't a sandwich. As long as you say hot dog, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, Wavelength, uh, another great game for digging into concepts like this. So uh, oh, iconography. Um, next up, we want to talk about a concept called framing. Um, because this is really important in data visualization, as we'll see in a minute. But also, Jeff, you, you, you think deeply about framing in uh, games you design. Uh, so can you just explain what framing is and give us, um, give us a game, well, talk about a game with some sure. experience on framing. Yeah, I mean, framing is basically that, um, you know, the way that data is presented will... Uh, you know, reflect on how it's in, it received, you know, whether it's, you know, you can frame things in a positive way or a negative way. Um, so uh, an example that I, I, I found very, you know, uh, personally fascinating uh, in one of my games. So this is a game called Pit Crew, uh, which is a real-time team-based game. So you're playing with teams, uh, two to three teams, and you can have up to like three or four people per team. And uh, you are trying to repair your race car and get it back out onto the track as quickly as possible. And um, so you're just, you're, you're quickly playing these cards to change the tires, to fill the gas tank and stuff like that. So yeah, now I, up here, we have an example of a car where, you know, the tires all been laid out and stuff like that. And as soon as you're finished with your car, uh, then you can start rolling a die to try to move your car around the track. Uh, which is ultimately uh, how you're scoring points is whoever gets furthest around the track is is the winner. And um, part of the design that I wanted in the game is I wanted you to make mistakes. You're going as fast as you can. You're trying to play cards that add up to 27. You're trying to play sequences of numbers. And, you know, you can, uh, sometimes you, you, you don't have the cards that you need and you're just, it's sort of like controlled chaos. We're like, okay, so, forget about it. We're just, we're not going to have, we only have three tires. We're just going to get out on the track just so we can start rolling and moving. I wanted that idea of trading off for, for errors in what you're doing, uh, intentional or otherwise, for trying to get back onto the track as quickly as possible. And after everyone is done uh, with playing the, the cards on their, on their race car and getting it out there, there's a step where you go back and you evaluate and you see what mistakes everybody made. And the team gets penalty points. You get one penalty point for each mistake that you make. And originally in the game, 
for every mis- every penalty point that you got, you had to move your car backwards on the track. And what I found is we went out and we started play testing it and, you know, just, it worked fine, you know, just from a mathematical standpoint, but when we started playing it, particularly when we were playing it with kids, uh, we found that it, uh, kids were very, very players in general and kids in particular were very uh, upset about having to move backwards on the track, right? They did everything that they could to avoid penalty points. And it did not have the feel that I wanted. I wanted a freewheeling game where you're just throwing cards down and playing it as quickly as possible, but they were getting so obsessed with like, you know, oh my God, is, is this right or is it wrong? Or what do we do that? It really, it didn't feel the way that I wanted it to feel. So we experimented with a couple of different ideas, but uh, the one that, yeah, you know, we we that I was most interested in was we changed it so that when you got penalty points, instead of moving your car backwards, all of the opponent's cars move forward. So if I got two penalty points, instead of me moving backwards two space, everybody else moved forward two spaces, and that's mathematically it's exactly the same thing, right? There's no f- real finish line. You count the number of laps you go around, but it's just whoever gets the furthest around the track. So, you know, whether you move backwards or the people move forward doesn't matter. But when we tested that with kids, it made all the difference in the world. They did not care nearly as much about their sister moving forwards as they cared about themselves moving backwards. And that completely changed the feel of the game and opened it up that the penalty points were bonuses for your opponents rather than penalties for you. So I think that that's just a, such an interesting example of mm. the way that just framing it mathematically is exactly the same, but it's people react psychologically to it in a completely different way yeah that, it's such a great uh ag- example um and yeah I, I love i haven't played this game unfortunately but i, I had another question about the the play testing on the lap but the board itself because the laps are really short right? you mm-hmm. could have you could have made this one big lap right you could have the, the lap could have been 30 squares but did you find there was something appealing about going round and round and perhaps lapping cars more often uh, than this well day if you're you're there's really not as much lapping of other cars <laughs> unless <laughs> unless some teams are bad I, in this case it was strictly just a usability thing there in terms of the box size and the space oh, yeah. the size mm-hmm. of each space so that all the wooden car tokens could fit in comfortably into a single space right. so i actually also form factor that's a great principle about data visualization <laughs> as yes. well isn't it you know it, it, it all links together um how many times do you play test a game out of curiosity do you think oh gosh uh <laughs> usually you're gonna test uh, you know uh, as the designer you're gonna play a game hundreds of times That's before amazing. it actually gets out on the market so amazing. yeah i admire your patience um <laughs> that's so, why the games i design are getting shorter and shorter <laughs> <laughs> so uh just to illustrate uh framing in data visualization uh an example if you've seen me talk you will have seen me use this before this was simon scar's award-winning visualization of deaths in iraq from 2003 to 2011 caused by conflict um so terrible awful data set horrible subject uh but you can see simon made some design choices to frame your reaction very strongly he pointed the bars down he colored them red and he gave it a three-word title all of which makes you see and feel the smear of blood you know and the human cost of the tragedy so wonderful piece of work about a terrible situation in iraq but if you turn those bars back up the normal way around and if you then make it a more normal neutral corporate blue actually there's a positive story potentially in this data set because deaths are the lowest they ever have been in this the period of this data set so the data is the same the chart is the same i just turned it upside down and changed the color so the framing of this data set is completely different um so really powerful concept all right where are we jeff we've done we've done dice we've done icons we've done framing now uh anybody who goes anywhere in data visualization very quickly learns about the atoms of data visualizations how we encode information uh and we're going to i'm going to talk about two games here both current favorites in the cogreave household um but before we do here's the here's a classic table if, if you're learning about data visualization you will probably have seen this in any course uh jeff how many nines are on this table of numbers you don't need I, to answer I, Okay. Yeah. Good. Right. Well. Okay. It, it's, that's not bad, actually. Uh, it's an, it's an okay. easy question to answer, but it's a tedious question to answer because you have yes. to do a serial lookup across all the digits to find and count the nines. If I make one change, now that answer 
it's you still have to count them, but you don't have to do any work to find the number nine digits, right? Uh, it was 13. Okay. Um, so not a good work. <laughs> uh, so I changed the color and all the nines popped out. So what's going on here? Position on the left, color in the middle. Hey, and look, if you actually use length, you've got a bar chart and the information becomes even easier to understand. These are examples of pre-attentive attributes. And it's these pre-attentive attributes that form the building blocks for all visualizations. Now, what if you made a game where the entire game removed all encoding attributes and forced you to do a serial lookup. Would that be fun? <laughs> uh, no, although, although no. plenty of people do word, word searches, which is basically that, right? That is true. Uh, and I would, I would, that is true, actually, I thought of that. Uh, I would also say there is a game that we are having a huge laugh, uh, wonderfully enjoying this game, playing it in our household at the moment. This is Micro Macro Crime City uh, from Spielwise, Spielwise Games. So the game I see is you've managed to avoid the Twitter war about this game about whether it's actually a game or not a game. But oh, I haven't seen that. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's a, that's wow. a debate I do not want to get into. If you think I, it's a I, game, it's a game. I'm very loose on that definition. Yeah, so sorry, oh, carry on. Well, <laughs> I, I've had many Twitter wars about the definition of a business dashboard. I'm I'm always good, happy waiting in, and in the, in the end, if if it's achieving the goal of having fun, in this case, I don't really care. Um, but I'm saying it's a game <laughs> for the purpose of this. So the game is essentially you get this huge map, which will fill your entire table. And it's a, it's a city. It shows things happening in a city. Crime is lurking around every corner. And your job with your it cooperatively is to investigate the myriad crimes uh, over a series of cases. So I'm going to give you a quick example. So here's a little subsection of the map. Um, and you might zoom in and, you know, you, you, the case is about what happened to this poor chap, right? <laughs> So then you have to start hunting around the map and finding where he has been. So you can see he's been walking around with a portion of chip, with a bag of chips. Um, you can go back even further in time and notice the bag of where he bought the bag of chips. Uh, the eagle eyed amongst you might notice he's also being followed by a rather shady character. So you keep going back looking for these characters and eventually you find him in his home where it turns out he's just been he's loaded his backpack full of money while being spied on by his uh guilty neighbor um so that's that's only a part of that case because then you can follow what happens to the perpetrator after the crime and uh, what happens to him so that's the game right and there's a whole bunch of these cases and what's brilliant about this is that it's not just that the cases themselves are fun and they tell interesting stories it's fun because you are being forced to do a serial lookup across the map there is no color encoding all the figures are pretty much the same size. So there's no movement or color or size. Everything's visually equal. So it's the opposite of a good chart. But because you're doing serial lookups and there are many stories happening across this map, you start seeing other things and you'll get sidetracked. So you'll be like, hang on, why is there a baby wandering around on its own? And then you start following the baby and for some reason the baby's having a cup of tea and then having a cake, right? And all these things. So as you play through the cases, you'll, you'll get to a case and you're like, oh, we did the baby. We, you know, you've seen some of this baby story already. And so, uh, oh, it's just great fun. Um, yeah, we're really enjoying this. Have you, have you played this? One, I, I did that sample one about that yep. bag with the money. So, but yeah, this is one that I wanted to try to get to the table. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think the difference is, and this is, you know, what's, what's kind of interesting about games in general is that I think that if you choose to do this activity right then it becomes entertaining but if if like i'm your boss and i give you this chart and i'm like you know here's here's our stuff i need you to you know solve these mysteries you know get back to me you know in an hour with your answers you'd be really annoyed at me because you know it's like why are you just you know why, why are you making my life so difficult or if yeah. you had to give a presentation about this later about what happened you you would like you said you'd color in these people you'd you know you you do different things you know with a game games are about ultimately about creating obstacles to arbitrary obstacles to achieving the goals, right? If there's no arbitrary mm -hmm. obstacles to doing it, it's not a game. Uh, you know, if I'm playing golf, I can just, if I can just walk over and just put the ball in the hole, I'm not playing a game anymore. You yeah. know, I create these obstacles for myself. And that's what you're doing here is you're taking away the affordances that we would normally expect with this type of a situation of you know being able to trace somebody to to kind of create this this arbitrary situation that you know some people find fun under certain circumstances some people find frustrating <laughs> but you can choose to participate in it or not 
Yeah, amazing. Um, I love that definition of a game. And again, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do with the aggregations of data that we display. So mm -hmm. yeah, good stuff. So yeah, I recommend that we're having a great time. Um, okay, I'm going to bring in another uh, lightweight game, talking about encoding information as well. And you don't get very far in data visualization without realizing how important size and color are and how they are pre-attentive attributes, but they come with caveats about their efficiency. And Illusion is a game which literally messes, is a bunch of cards with visual tricks designed to mess with your senses. And the goal is to take a, a sequence of cards um, and put them in order of the amount of that color on the card, right? So here's, you're gonna to get to play this in a second, Jeff. <laughs> so here's uh, four cards laid from left to right in, well, hopefully ascending order of the amount of red, the percentage of card, which is red. Okay, so if that is the card you draw, Jeff, where does it go in the sequence? Which card does it fit between, or is it on the ends? Um, hmm. I did deliberately yeah. set this up to be really hard. <laughs> this is a tricky one too, because your brain also like completes those red rings. Yeah, whereas they're absolutely. not actually completed. So I mean, mm. my gut is telling me we go right in the middle, but it's also could possibly be like in the second position because you got that big block of red there. Like second here? Or second? No, no, no. Oh, right. All I'm right. Thinking, well, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. say I'm gonna say right in the middle. I'll go with my first instinct. You correct correctly oh, okay. guessed, Jeff. But <laughs> <laughs> I. This is a particularly hard layout, so you know yeah. sometimes it is easy. 21, 22, 23. You really set yeah, me the, up here. I, <laughs> I did <completely. laughs> but, you, but you identified it, it brilliantly, right? You know, we, we are trying to complete these, even the, the corners get completed. Um, we are hopeless in uh, estimating size. Yep. You know, you might see a lot of bubble charts. Oh, yeah. I that's why can... bubble charts, I just I'm not a big mm. fan of the bubble chart. It's not just a big our fan. brains are not good at interpreting what those really mean. Yeah. So in fact, Jeff, I'm going to put you to the test again. If F is 100, what is G? Uh, at 35? No, that's pretty good. It's 40. Uh, okay. We've, 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 uh, we've asked about 2,500 people that question, and about 70% get it within 10. But, okay. the spread of, but the spread of people who get it wrong is huge. Yeah. You know, people are all over the place. If you show the same information as a bar chart, about 90% of people get it right. Right. And everybody's... Yeah, we're, we're good at heights. You know, yeah. heights, but yeah. areas, yeah, judging areas and volume is a whole other level of, yeah. Crazy. Yes. And, and sure. that is why uh, Illusion is such a fun game because it plays, again, with, that, uh, with all the things we, our brains are doing to confuse us and it mm -hmm. exploits the confusion. So, yeah, nice lightweight game. Um, yeah. Yeah, fun. I, I, I'm not aware of that one. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Um, all right. Now, we've been this... talking for... Quite... Oh, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Okay. We've been talking for quite a while, and the astute amongst you may have noticed we haven't yet really shown much in the way of board games. Uh, so I think for the, for the remainder, we're going to show some of our favorite board games, because as we'll see... Board games, you know what, in a way, they're kind of like dashboards, right? In the book, the big book, the dashboards, we really talked about thinking about layout, about the user's flow around the board, about emphasizing certain areas and making distinct regions. And guess what? That's the board game designer's challenge. Hey, old Andy just made a really good point, but hi, everybody. This is future Andy coming in to break his flow. Yep, the episode was so good, we've decided to split it into two episodes. Uh, so, so far, we've seen games that focus on pre-attentive attributes and colour and things like that. But next time, as old Andy said, it's boards and what they're kind of like, dashboards and visual design. So join us because we're going to be talking about some of my favourite games. Wingspan, this gorgeous, gorgeous game with beautiful il illustrations of birds from across the world. Oh, it's gorgeous. And we're also going to be talking about this one that's really heavy, Terraforming Mars. It's an absolute monster, but it's my favorite game of all time. And it's just great. So check this out. We're going to be talking about that and more next time. In the meantime, there's links below to what we've been talking about in this episode. But really, I want you all to come back next time to see what these games teach us all about data visualization. See you there.